Hi guys, and today I'm finally driving the new Land Rover Defender. In fact, this is the new new one because this is the Defender 90, it's the three door and it's brown. So today I can finally say I am the brown car guy because I have a brown car. Isn't it awesome? Actually, it's not really brown. They call it Gondwana stone with black contrast roof and the bonnet as well. Interesting, these little plaques here on the top of the bonnet, they used to be aluminum in the old car. They now resemble that, but I don't think it's aluminum. It looks plastic to me. Anyway, so this is the new Defender 90. It's got three liter six cylinder engine this is the uh, uh, p400 hse top of the range model uh, so it's got 400 brake horsepower that's good for zero to uh, 100 kilometers per hour zero to 62 miles per hour in six seconds that's pretty quick uh, a top speed of 130 miles per hour uh, it will give you um 25 uh miles uh, 25 miles per gallon 25 lit yeah 25 miles per gallon let me get that right and 252 co2 emissions now i've driven the car up here i'll do some driving impressions in the car but also the fact is that it does feel like a, a land rover if not quite a defender it is not like any defender that i've ever driven before and that's probably a good thing, which I'll get into a bit later on. We're also going to look at the practicality because this is a three door. So is it less practical than the four door? It is a, it is a shorter car. So let's have a look at that. Before let's have a look at the back here. I do. I'm interested in following these cars on the motorway on the way here. And I see what they've done here. This motive here. This is for the main lights. It's very much like the new generation Range Rover. That makes sense to me. A little bit odd is the placement of the indicator, which maybe is to show the extremity of the car. I'm not quite sure, but it seems kind of odd that they're down, down there. I don't know why they weren't incorporated into there, but quite a blocky feel. I'm not surprised that there's a Lego version of this car because the car looks like it was designed with Lego. It's really cool, which I kind of like. It's, it's sort of uh, a toy sort of thing. So it's a side hinge door with a big heavy wheel, uh, spare tire and wheel on the back there. Opens up like that. A couple of pockets here. It's got all of these, um, you know, Easter egg things where you have these nuts, which are not necessary, I guess, in a car like this anymore of this era, but you have all of these facilities. There's your handle there. In here, you've got this rubberized mat. So that's to keep things, you know, nice and dry should you need to do that. Um, there's a divider. These are obviously uh, seats that can fall down. Let's see if I can do that. From there, there comes the thing. And obviously the seat is in the way, but that should fall relatively flat, especially if I take the, uh, the headrest out, as you can see. And again, the back of it is kind of rubberized. So that's a little bit more hard wearing. There's a power supply on this side, a three-pointed plug. I'm not quite sure what that is. I'll find out and put it on the screen later. I'm not sure what that, that block is there. Uh, hook for your uh, stuff, or maybe it's for the tonneau cover, I'm not sure. Over here, you can actually raise and lower the height of the car for loading, unloading, and stuff like that. So that's quite handy. And, uh, you know, uh, items also for to uh, to 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 um, the tow bar hitching and stuff like that. Um, another power supply over here. So lots of power supplies. Quite rugged, quite rough. I see what they've done here. It's very much for that leisure lifestyle sort of situation where you can just throw stuff in, whether it's wet or hard or rough edged or not having to worry about scratching it and stuff like that. One of the things about the new Defender is that it's a more upmarket, more precious car than the older one. And maybe some owners might be a little bit shy about abusing it and using it perhaps the way it was intended. But I guess what they've done here is to give you a little bit of reassurance that you can do. So that's quite good. Let's see what the interior is like. We'll do that next. Oh, that's a heavy door with the tire on it. There you go. Where am I? Where am I? I'm here. There's a little lever and this of course is the famous uh, seat in the middle, the bench seat for the new Land Rover, which goes all the way down and becomes the center console. And to be honest, six foot two, this is my driving position. Uh, we've got um, USBs here, we've got a pocket, got cup holders, a handle, skylight, big panoramic roof. I don't feel claustrophobic. I don't feel tight. I've got room for my knees. My legs, feet are a bit tight. Headroom's not too bad. I could actually ride in the back here. Also got a center armrest. Three people might be a bit tight. Two people, no problem at all. This is quite usable for a family. What's it like in the front? Let's find out. So you find me in the uh, 400 brake horsepower car, now already on the move. Now this is a launch, this is a press launch. So I can't do the videos the way I normally do. I just don't have the time available to me. So uh, I'm not able to show you the full interior um, using my handheld uh, phone, uh, but hopefully I'll be able to get some footage from Land Rover, which I'll insert here so you can look at the interior of the car. But I will talk to you about it as I'm driving. Um, and actually we're on a really good road. Now, one of the things I found even driving it up here um, to what was essentially our lunch stop uh, was that it doesn't drive like any Land Rover or any Defender, I should say, that I've driven before. For example,
example, I can chuck it around here. Okay, there's a little bit of body lean, but and it's not really, you know, uh, super sharp steering, although the play is less than I would have imagined. It's way less than if you're used to driving an old Defender than you would imagine. Also, like I did a two hour stint, to two, over two hours to get here on the motorway and look how comfortable I am in this car. My legs are outstretched. I'm wearing boots because I got room for them, headroom. The only disappointment is, okay, thank you. Uh, and look at this display it's fantastic and it's all touch very nicely done and you see that even when you are set on the home screen so you're off the navigation I've got heads up I've got navigation on my instrument panel which is also digital entirely configurable this here is your home screen and it shows my phone it shows radio station but it's still showing you the navigation even though I'm not on the navigation this is unique I've not seen this before even though I'm not on the navigation it's still showing me that I need to go left and you know where my next uh, instruction is and everything is showing me on that screen which is quite extraordinary full acceleration it does move I'm not sure that I feel the 0 to 60 in uh, under 6 seconds acceleration I'd expect that to be, be a bit quicker but it's the quickest Defender I've ever driven that's for sure I can say that with a there you go bit of kick down you've got sports mode as well so if I slow down and try that again yeah, the response there was much, much quicker um, to the gearbox. They, they always use a great gearbox on the, uh, on the Jaguar Land Rover products, and this one's no different. You know, there's no paddles. You don't need them. Interesting thing, this doesn't have that uh, shift knob, the all-terrain thing. It doesn't have that anymore because, basically, it's, it's cleverer than that. I always thought that, why do you need to, why do you have to tell it what, you know, shouldn't it be? No, now it knows where it is. It knows what it's doing. It detects itself. You do get some buttons here. So you've got, I think, lower range button there. You've got traction off. Um, you've got hill descent. And you can raise and lower the suspension from here as well. But pretty much, you just leave it in drive or put into sports as we can do now and it will just take care of itself that's you know it will know where it is it'll know what it's doing it know what it needs to do which is extraordinary for a land rover huh remember back in the day the old defenders you know you had to know three or four different levers what they all did and set them all upright before you could go anywhere now put in drive and do whatever across the world you know um you do sit very high up. I was, I was saying, wasn't I, that the window ledge now, that's one of the features that to me was a very strong part of Range Rover and Defender was to be able to put your elbow on the window ledge. Uh, you can't, it's, it's getting higher and higher, you know. It doesn't look so dignified anymore. Soon you'll be like up here. But having said that, there's plenty of room. This, of course, is the middle seat, the bench seat part of the middle part of the bench seat, which is now lowered and I can use it as, you know, cup holder or shelf to store things. Um, storage wise, not that hot because unless they have a different uh, arrangement for here that you can get because you've only got this really and then nothing really here to put your phone and stuff although you've got USBs and power supplies and all that they're all over the place then that's no problem at all um, but not so many spaces to put stuff uh, you've got that tray over there um, which at the moment has got like sanitizer stuff in it and what have you nice little Defender logo again that whole Easter egg thing is carried through with the exposed rivets and all of this sort of stuff to give you that feel you've got grab handles here and here on the on the uh, the edge of the dashboard itself there's a bit of a grab handle I suppose to pull yourself in from outside when you're trying to get into the car uh, very well equipped of course good sound system I've been using it's got all DAB and Bluetooth and Apple CarPlay and all the rest of it and there's a speaker right up here um, uh, it's got a subwoofer as well which I turned right up so that was quite good it's a good stereo system actually really nice and obviously tuned to this um, one thing I will say is that where you may still feel now this is interesting because obviously there's not a body on frame uh, car anymore it's a monocoque so it's all in one sort of it's construction if you like um, but you still get a little bit of a, a, a shimmy, a shake, a little bit of rattling in this car, which, you know, maybe a lot of modern rivals wouldn't necessarily have. Um, it's nothing excessive. It's nothing offensive or disruptive, but it's, you're just aware of it when the road gets particularly bumpy. The suspension on this is quite firm. So it's not like it doesn't wallow or float. I mean, you can see that. And there's no settings for it. It's one setting. It makes up its mind. It decides what's best for you. And that's what you're getting. And, um, you know, you do 
you get moved a little bit here and there but not aggressively not jarringly but you do feel it but where i would have thought that maybe it might be a bit roly-poly a bit floaty it isn't yeah if you check around the corners as we did earlier on in this route then you could see that there was a bit of body lean uh, but essentially it still holds that pretty tightly the turn in is okay it's not too bad i wouldn't say that there's marked understeer it's more sort of um sweeping understeer if you like but not excessive not worrying of any kind whatsoever um, and generally it handles itself very well the other thing i would say is that we've driven it to small uh, lanes country lanes the villages and stuff like that I haven't driven it in london yet but um and again this is the three door although the width is probably the same as the five door and it's perfectly manageable so this is a big car you can see it's a big car i can see the bonnet but that makes it easier to place i can see the the plate on this side but i can also see the plate on the other side so again that maybe helps to place the car um but and i'm sitting i'm sitting very high up Thank you very much. I'm sitting very high up, so I've got good vis I have that visibility. I can exchange glances with truck drivers and stuff like that. Um, but uh, and you know, you, but you, you know, you have a high center of gravity. But you're able to see over cars. You're able to see what's going on. You can place the car very easily. And um, third exit of the roundabout. And over here at slower speeds, it's come up now. A little button comes up here on the instrument. Only at slower speeds it comes up, and immediately gives you a bird's eye 360 as well as front and rear uh, of the car, so you can literally place it exactly. And I've noticed that it also has a translucent look about it as well. So it has a translucent look about it as well. So I guess that's for the off-roading bit, which we're hopefully going to do a bit later on, and that gives you an idea of what's under the car. Um, I got to say though, overall. I think that the the I I have to say this. I'm kind of in two minds about this car because on the one hand, um, I don't think that this is a Defender anymore. Uh, it's much better than a Defender, to be fair. Uh, but is it? Uh, and it probably still does everything a Defender could do, and it's probably rugged enough to handle all of that. Um, but you do feel a bit precious about it because it is a nicer car, a more upmarket car, such nicely pointed. All of this is soft. Even this is soft here, actually, and this is this is nicely done. But it's all very, very nicely appointed and everything. So you kind of want to look after it. So you, you kind of want to look after the car. Um, but with the skylights at the back, this dashboard feel, the way that it... Okay, lady. Uh, with the dashboard feel, the way this is done, the way this is, it puts me in mind of the first Discovery. Yes, I was there. I drove. I, re I reviewed the first ever Discovery um, back in 90 or 91, I think it was. And uh, th this to me feels like a, a successor to that car. Um, is that odd? No, it's not odd. I think that makes sense because as the Defender LR3, LR4, whatever you want to call it these days or whatever they call it these days, as that's moved more up market and closer to the Range Rover, I think it, it makes sense that this is now the successor to it. Uh, okay, guys, you find us at uh, Land Rover Experience East Nor. This is where they do all their experience stuff, but also their testing. And this is we're on the route now where the Defender was actually signed off. Uh, we're in a P300, this is a base spec model, so it doesn't have air suspension, um, it gets coil suspension, and so a few less features, but an increased ride height, it's on the same tyres as we had yesterday, which are, they call the adventure spec tyres, and uh, we are now doing what they uh, say is a sign off, is where they, it was important for them to sign off the Defender before it gets uh, released. So it'll be quite interesting. Uh, very, very muddy, very, very slippery because it's been raining a lot recently. It's not raining today right now, thank you, uh, thankfully, but uh, it has been raining. So th that makes things interesting. Very different to off-roading in the Middle East, if you're watching this uh, there. Um, but, you know, this is kind of Land Rover country. So, so far we've done one set, we've done actually two set of woods so far already and had no problem with them whatsoever. Um, and I'm just trying to get my speed up here because it's on hill descent. Right, there you go. Um, and, you know, it's, it just makes everything look so easy. We've gone through some really deep mud splashes, some really, like, really deep mud. And you just think, wow, I mean, you know, but you could actually even stop in the middle of it and start off again and it's fine. 
So these cars are base spec, but you know, these are the kind of cars that a lot of people would buy, particularly in Europe, particularly for fleet sales and stuff like that. They've got everything you need, and of course, they're able to do all of this stuff. Um, less power than the ones we had yesterday, but that makes sense because really you don't need a lot of power uh, in this sort of environment. Um, so not really off-roading uh, Middle East spec, more off-roading European spec, but a real demonstration of what these cars can do. Um, we've got a full hill ter uh, uh, terrain systems, terrain select system here. There's a button here that you press, got an image of the car with an arrow to the right. Once you press that, that all comes up on there. And then you get a selection of where you can have mud and ruts and sand and all the rest of it. Pretty much you can leave it in auto, but if you do that, then you can do that. You, we, so we, we, we put it into mud and ruts, obviously, for this bit. And I've got the cameras on so I can see the size of the car and the front of the car, see where it is, because sometimes you're over a crest and you can't really see what's going on. Mostly the car is just following the ruts around and you can see each edge of the car through this uh, camera system as well. I've also got this graphic here, which is also a similar graphic on my instrument panel, which is also showing me the angle of the wheels and what's being locked and unlocked and all the rest of it. The steering is really the trick to understand, because I, I mean, I still struggle with that, is you need to let the car follow the ruts, but you still need to give it a little bit of steering input. How the steering responds um, on the car, you know, um, it's a case of sometimes just waiting, uh, lifting off and letting it respond because if you turn the wheel and you're still accelerating, that all that's happening in the car, the, 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 it's just scraping the mud and just carry on going forward because it hasn't actually got any grip at the front. <laughs> Done that a few times. Water splashing up each side completely surrounded, I mean almost coming up to the bonnet and now this is really like literally like I think like the, the the bottom of the car just sitting on a tablet of mud you know with the wheels on each side it's quite I mean you, you I mean you know if I wasn't part of this and I wasn't following an instructor and a, and a convoy I'd be like nah nah not happening not doing this so it's only because I know that it's a it's possible that I'm doing this it's extraordinary I mean this isn't this no thing <laughs> we are really it's just mud it's just like we are there's no ground there's no surface it's all how are you even gripping how is it even moving and it's slightly bang it's slightly uphill so we're on a, an ascent so not only are you trying to grip but you're moving us uphill at the same time you're amazing so we're going on to some steps now. Here we go. We're out of that. Really? Too much power and the wheels are just spinning and not actually doing anything. Too little and it's not going to make it. It's not going to get up that uh, slight incline. One thing I've noticed about this, when it's on mud and ruts, it's automatic, and it's locking and locking the disc, but you can see it's doing it by itself. It decides when to do it. Green is, I think, unlocked, and then orange is when it's locked or partially locked. So, very, very clever. It gives you so much confidence to basically, you know, trust the car and know that it knows what to do. I'm about to go through a big water splash now. Look at this, whoa, ho, ho, lot of water. Very muddy, very, very slippery, lot of twigs. Lot of, oh my lord, wow. That's incredible. What an incredible thing. my god that was incredible what an incredible course this has been this is really really tough four cars went out only two are coming back i'm not even joking so yeah this is this really shows what this car can do and how even a novice like me can actually manage to well hopefully get it home in one piece we're not quite done yet but hopefully fingers crossed
Wow, what an amazing experience. I think this is my third visit here to East Nor, and I've done a few of the routes here before, but this was the toughest route that we've done. And of course it would be, wouldn't it? Because it is the Defender. This of course is their flagship when it comes to off-roading, which is what Land Rover is about. The car was tested, developed, and uh, signed off on these very routes. Can it do the business? Well, yeah, look at it. It's got mud all over it. I've got a bit of mud on me, but it is a phenomenal thing. And it's done an incredible job in these really very, today, very challenging environment. We've had a lot of rain here recently. It's nice now, but it meant that there was a lot of mud there and it was very, very slippery. This was the P300, as I mentioned. So this was kind of like the base spec. So the lower engine, but uh, coil suspension. And it was interesting to take this one around because you had to little, work a little bit harder with the car, but it just helped you to get through the route and demonstrated what could be done. Of course, on the road, we drove the P400, which was like the flagship model, full spec. It's got everything on it. Between the two, I think that obviously for the Middle East market, the P400 full spec is the car to go for. Um, and I think in the sand, that would probably work better as well anyway, because it needs more power. But having said that, an incredible beast, uh, amazing demonstration we've had here today. So yeah, full thumbs up for the new Defender 90. Hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know what you thought of the car and the video, anything else you want to talk about in the comments above below elsewhere. Make sure you're subscribing to this channel. This is youtube.com forward slash Murtering Middle East and make sure you're following Murtering Middle East on all of its channels. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you again soon.